I correct? Yep, 6.30, right on the dot. All right, well, it is good to see everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful week. I want to make an announcement before I forget. I got an email. The FCA is, uh, there. there's a new movie that's come out, The Kendrick Brothers. It uh, has to do with uh, fathers. And, of course, the whole um, thrust is, of the movie is to put the emphasis on our Heavenly Father and then for a relationship with the Father through Christ. Anyways, the FCA is uh, wanting to take the football team to the the movie. They're going to take them to get something to eat, and they're going to take them to the movie. They're asking for sponsors. It's $20 per kid, so if you'd like to uh, sponsor a kid to be able to go, they'll definitely hear the gospel. So um, let me know if you'd like to do that. So I just wanted to mention that before I got started so I would not um, forget. Also... Um, we've got on the back table, yes, the, the Christmas ministry we're doing for the children in Togo. And, um, of course, that's in, in honor of the Etheridges and their service there in Togo. If you would feel led, get one of those lists. Get it tonight because the deadline is actually the 20th. Is that correct? Sunday. I know it's a short notice. Um, but it was just something that was dropped in our lap, an opportunity, so we wanted to make that available to you. And those are just some suggestions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, and so we've got some bags in the office if you want to stop by before you leave and kind of see a sample. And then it's, it's uh, $5 for postage. So great opportunity, once again, to get the gospel out. Um, and then finally, committees. We are not officially meeting, having our committee training, excuse me. Um, but we do need you as committees to meet uh, as soon as you possibly can to elect your officers. That's very, very important because as, as ministry comes available through the year, we need to be able to have a contact person. And if not, if you don't, if you don't elect a chairman, then it's just kind of in limbo and nobody knows what to do. So please get your committees together and get those uh, officers um, elected. All right, I think that's it. Okay, praises. Who has got a praise tonight? Somebody's got a praise tonight. Somebody's got to praise tonight. Miss Sherry. Okay. Praise the Lord. Okay. Okay. Amen. Other praises? Anybody? Who, who praise the Lord, you're saved tonight? Amen. Boy, that's something that we can praise Him for every day. That, uh, as Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And, uh, boy, that gives us hope, and that's our anchor that holds us. Other praises? Anybody? All right. Well, let's, uh, let's have a time of prayer. Awesome. That's wonderful. Man, so that's about what, 50 water filters roughly? Oh, great. Okay.
okay? Great. All right, well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this evening. Lord, I thank you for all these you've brought out. Lord, I thank you for all the blessings, uh, Lord, and praises, and just allowing us to be here tonight. Lord, that we can come boldly into your throne room of grace because of what you did for us on the cross. And Lord, I thank you uh, for this provision to buy buckets for um, water in Guyana. Lord, we do pray for that, uh, that you would provide some buckets. Lord, that you would, you would soften some hearts, perhaps even donate buckets. And so, Lord, we lift that need to you. Lord, we pray for our children and youth as they'll meet tonight. And thank you for their leaders. And just pray, Father, that, um, that you will bless their time together as well. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, as always, I know I say this every time, but uh, just to keep it fresh on our, our minds, keep, we want to keep this as updated as possible. So if you have an update, please let us, let us know. All right, so we're praying for these uh, families in grief, the family of Agnes Kennedy. That's Karen Rogerson's, that's Karen Rogerson's grandmother, so we pray for, for Karen and her family. Then under the recent request... As you look at any of these uh, needs, do you have an update on any of these recent requests? Okay. Okay. That's great. So she is uh, doing well. Okay. All right. Um, any others? Michelle had her uh, epidural. It went pretty good. Um, continue to pray that uh, the epidural will bring more relief so that uh, she can avoid anything further with that. All right, any other updates? Okay, I'll give you a chance in just a moment to give a new request. Um, all right, moving down the list to the non-medical needs. We continue to pray for these needs. This um, need with the um, Friendship Baptist over there in Malone, that's Linda's daughter, uh, goes there. And Cincinnati, they've had seven church members pass away. So they're just through various things. Um, they had a man... This week, he was loading up hay, and a thing of hay fell on top of him, and just different tragedies. So pray for that uh, that family. Um, okay, COVID related. Can we um, update any of these names? Kayla. Kayla's back at school. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. All right. Okay. Cancer related. Any updates on any of the cancer needs that we've been praying for? Okay. Ongoing needs. We've got a lot of ongoing uh, needs. Do, do we have any updates to any of these names? Okay. Of course, our homebound assisted living, we always pray for them. Um, I was going to mention some. Oh, yeah, Miss Betty Norris. I had talked to Sesame, the director up there, and Miss Betty had gone home. <laughs> Atlanta and was exposed to COVID so they told Miss Betty she had to stay in her room 
Well, if you know Miss Betty, <laughs> that was a challenge. Um, but anyways, we pray for these ladies. Carol Rathel, um, pray for Miss Carol Rathel. She's really having a time. We're trying to get a ramp installed over there at her house. But uh, pray for her daughter, Vicki. Vicki is, um, she's able to work out of home, but she is her mother's caregiver. And uh, if you have done that, you know as a caregiver, that really is, um, that can be very taxing at times. And so uh, pray for, for Vicki. Praying for our missionaries and those preparing for ministry, our military personnel, law enforcement, fighter fighters, emergency medical services. Pray for uh, Josiah Ward. He um, he did make it, and he was he was given a real short phone call where he could call home, and um, he's doing well, as well as you can do in uh, <laughs> basic training, right? But uh, pray for Josiah as uh, he's in the midst of his training. College students, pray for our college students, our schools, and certainly our nation. We pray for revival and awakening and uh, pray for salvation in our leaders from the top down. I've said this before, but can you imagine? Of course, we don't know his heart. But could you imagine if um, our president were to get saved? Because when somebody really gets saved, they change. And uh, wouldn't that be just wonderful? And God can do it. You know, sometimes I, I can only speak for myself, but sometimes I limit what God can do, but God can do it. And so we, we want to pray for our leaders and specifically for their salvation, that they will turn to Christ. Um, spiritual needs. Is there somebody you want to pray for that has a spiritual need? Anybody? Somebody that you want to see saved? Somebody maybe is just struggling in their walk with the Lord? Burge? Okay. Anybody else? Okay, we got an unspoken. Audrey. David, okay. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Nancy and Chris, okay. Okay. All right. Any other spiritual needs? Yes, ma'am. Irvin and Marlene. Okay. All right. Any other needs? I know I haven't opened the floor for just general needs. Do you have any requests tonight? Any, any requests at all? Yes, ma'am. Susan Davis. Okay. Gloria, yes, Miss Gloria. She's still in the hospital. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other needs? Anyone? Okay. Well, let's take these needs to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and we thank you uh, again for allowing us to come tonight. Lord, I thank you for the, the children that you've brought uh, tonight. What a blessing. And Lord, we continue to pray that you would send us younger families with, with children. 
Lord, tonight we've got a lot of physical needs, and, and Lord, we, we pray for these, these physical needs and, and pray, Father, that you would bring healing. We pray that through the physical, you would do a great work spiritually. Uh, Lord, we uh, pray, Father, for those like Miss Vicki who are, who are taking care of, of their loved ones, and we pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them in those times that they get discouraged. Lord, give them patience. Lord, tonight we, uh, we want to pray for our medical uh, personnel, Lord, and we just ask that you would strengthen doctors and nurses and everyone who is in that industry, and we just pray that uh, you would encourage them. Uh, Lord, we pray for cancer patients. Lord, we pray for our shut-ins. Lord Jesus, uh, Father, we, we think about our nation and we see all kinds of things happening in our nation, but Lord, we know that the, the answer is, is the same for all, and that's Jesus. And so, Lord, we, we pray that we would see a great movement of your Spirit go across this land. We pray for a, a spiritual healing. We pray that people would cry out to you in repentance and in faith. Lord, we pray for our uh, schools and our our teachers and administrators, that you give them wisdom. We pray for our college students as uh, many times they are exposed to uh, all kinds of worldly philosophies and worldviews that can be very, very confusing and oftentimes professors purposely attack Christians and Lord, we pray for our college students that they would stand firm in their faith, they would get into the Word every day and, and be grounded in the Word. Lord, pray for Josiah tonight as he is... Uh, He's in basic training. We, we pray for his training, that that would go well. We pray for his, his physical safety, but, Lord, we also pray for him spiritually, that he would stay encouraged, that you would put other believers in his path that, uh, that he can draw strength from. Lord, tonight I pray for all these, these uh, spiritual needs that have been called out tonight. And, Lord, I, I pray for Verge and this unspoken need. I pray for Audrey tonight. Lord, for David pray for Nancy and Chris and Irvin and Marlene. Lord, I pray for a family that showed up this evening with uh, needing food. But Lord, um, just, uh, obviously a lot of spiritual needs in that situation. And pray that you would speak to their hearts, bring them to a place of repentance. Lord, tonight we pray for our president. Lord, we pray for his salvation, that he would... He would be convicted of his sins, and that he would he would turn to Christ, and that you would you would use uh, as as he comes to know you, that you would transform his life, and that it would be a powerful witness, Lord. And we know that uh, that you can do it; that you are able to do far more abundantly than what we we can even possibly imagine. And Lord, forgive us when we think about people, and we we in our minds think that they're too far gone. Uh, Lord, or their hearts are too hardened, Lord, we, we know that uh, there is always hope uh, because of the gospel. And may we be a gospel-centered people. May we live lives of joy despite our circumstances because we know that you are holding on to us, that we belong to you, and we thank you for the hope of the gospel. And may we be a people who share the gospel with our lips, but certainly may we live out the gospel with our lives. Lord, I pray for other needs that, that were not mentioned tonight. Lord, I pray for the unspoken needs. I pray for the needs of those who, who may be watching on Facebook. We, just, we thank you that you tell us to bring our needs uh, before you and, because you care for us, and we thank you. And so, Lord, tonight as we go to your word, teach us from your word tonight. As we're in this midweek service, we're all tired, and help us to, to be attentive to your word, open our minds to the truth that you have for us tonight, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Well, tonight, we go back to the book of Judges, and uh, we're in Judges chapter 13 tonight. Judges chapter 13. The uh, title of tonight's message is The Birth of a Savior. The Birth of a Savior. You say, Brother Michael, we're not in the Christmas season. But you notice I said the birth of a Savior, not the birth of the Savior. But we do see tonight uh, the, the um, introduction to our final judge, and that's Samson. 
And God raises up Samson in order to be uh, a savior-like figure to the children of Israel. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at the, the life of, uh, of Samson. You know, a lot of times in our, our uh, children's curriculum and sometimes VBS, you know, you talk about Samson, and, and really we kind of polish up the character of Samson. But Samson was a rough character. He had lots and lots of flaws. And so we're going to look at his life in detail. And really, Judges chapter 13 is just an introduction to his, uh, to his life. And so we're going to look at these verses, 1 through 25, but we're not going to read it all at one time. We'll, I've broken it up into several different sections, and we'll read it as we go along. So first of all, in verses 1 through 3, I want us to look at the angel's announcement. The angel's announcement. It says there in verse 1, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now I just want to stop there for just a moment. We, we see the same pattern with the children of Israel. They turn back to idolatry. But do you see something that's a little bit different here than in the past? What do the children of Israel not do this time? That's right. They don't cry out to the Lord this time. And, and really, this is what you see in the book of Judges. As, as we move along in the book of Judges, you see this deepening of the, of, the, of the wickedness in the land. And the children of Israel get further and further away from the Lord. So it, it, it says here that, again, they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. In other words, they turned back to paganism and idolatry. Uh, and so the Lord disciplines his children and he gives them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. That's a long time, but yet despite 40 years of oppression, they still don't cry out to the Lord. But we're going to see God's hand of grace and mercy. Even when his children don't cry out to him, he still raises up a deliverer for them in the life of uh, Samson. And you know what? That is a great reminder of all of our need for grace because in reality there wasn't a single frazzling one of us before we came to Christ that were really seeking after God. In fact, the book of Romans says there are none who seek after him. Not a one. If it were not for God's grace coming and hunting us down, we would all still be dead and lost in our sins. That's just testimony of God's grace. And we see that demonstrated here in the children of Israel. Pick up in verse 2. Now there was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Okay, so here is the angel's announcement. We've already seen this hopeless nation in the, in, in, with Israel had turned away from the Lord once again, and for 40 years they're under oppression from the Philistines. And then we're introduced to this helpless couple. This, uh, this couple, the husband's name is Manoah, the wife's name is not mentioned, and she's just Manoah's wife. And they have a problem. What is their problem? They're barren. She can't have children. And you know, uh, that is very difficult, but in our culture, we don't we don't understand really what that meant in this culture as much because in this culture if you were barren that was a really big stigmatism on your life many people viewed that as the judgment of God upon your life but to be barren presented a really big problem and they want to take a stab at it what was the problem if you're barren there's no heirs the family name does not continue and that was really a, a, a big concern especially for for the wife she wanted to give her, her husband many children, especially sons, so that the family name could carry on. Because there was a lot of men who were not godly men, and if their wife could not produce children, they would divorce their wife. They would put their wives away. Or the husband might die, and if you're a woman who cannot have children, well, what man is going to marry a woman who can't have children? So this was a, uh, this was a very difficult situation for them. The text doesn't say this, but more than likely they had many, many times tried to have children and they just could not, for whatever reason, could not have, have uh, children. So then comes this hopeful announcement. 
says that the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now just imagine what would be going on in the heart of this mother who cannot have children, no telling how long she had been, want, been trying to have children. She's probably old at this point. And now this angel of the Lord has come to her and given her this word of of uh, hope and, l- and let me just say this this is another reminder that god's timing is always absolutely perfect always perfect and and that's something that it's easy to say amen to but sometimes it's hard to live out right you, you know you, you you maybe you you can relate to this couple you say you know we've never been able to have children or there's something in your life that you're you're wanting God's timing is always perfect, and it doesn't always work out the way that we would like for it to work out, but we trust the Lord with it. But in God's perfect timing, he comes to them at at just the right time, because again, the nation of Israel, they're in bondage to the Philistines, and so he's going to send the nation of Israel a a Savior-like figure in Samson. So this is the announcement that was was, uh, given to them. Now, this is a special baby announcement. You, can you think of other places in Scripture where, where a mom or dad was given an announcement from an angel that they would, they would have a child? I like to do this on Wednesday nights just to test our Bible knowledge, okay? Sarah, okay, in the, in the book of Genesis, right? Abraham. And, of course, what did Sarah do, by the way? She laughed, right? Um, okay, who else? Elizabeth. All right, now, was it Elizabeth that received the message? Her husband, technically, right? And then, of course, Jesus. The angel Lord comes to uh, Mary and gives her this promise that she would conceive a child, the Son of God. All right, so that's the angel's announcement. Now let's move on to verse 4 through 7. We see the mother's instructions. This angel of the Lord is going to give this mother some very specific instructions. Therefore, be careful. Be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head and the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall begin to save Israel from the land of the Philistines. Notice the task of of, uh, Samson is he's going to begin the process to save Israel from the Philistines. But even after Samson is gone, the Philistines are still a a thorn in the Israelite side, even to the day of David. But he's going to begin this process of delivering the Israelites from the Philistines. Verse 6, then the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. That's an understatement. I did not ask him where he was from and he did not tell me his name, but he said to me, behold, you you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. All right. So here is this, uh, these instructions that are given this mother. Okay, she is told specifically that, first of all, she's not to drink of the vine. She's not to partake of, of, of alcohol. She's also not to eat anything that is unclean, and she's told that no razor shall come upon his head. Why is she to do all these things? Why are these the instructions? Because he's going to be a what? A Nazarite. Now, we're not going to turn to the book of Numbers, uh, but in the book of Numbers, it gives the instructions for taking a Nazarite vow. Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 specifically. A Nazarite vow was was a voluntary vow. Of course, in this case, um, Samson was, was volunteered by the Lord. He didn't have much say in this. But in the normal circumstances, it was a voluntary decision that you would dedicate yourself uh, fully to the Lord, you know, for some kind of special assignment. Most of the time, it lasts about a month, okay? And during that time, 
there were some things that you were to not do during that period. Number one, you were not to, to drink of the vine or eat of the vine. Okay? Again, you were not to partake in alcohol at all. You were not to cut your hair, and you were not to be around the corpse of a dead animal or a dead person. Okay. Now, two people in the Bible, uh, they were lifelong Nazarites. Obviously, Samson, and who would have been the second person? That's right, John the Baptist in the New Testament. Lifetime uh, Nazarites, set apart completely to um, the Lord. And so she is given these instructions. She is told uh, to, to be very, very careful because, yes, she's given this hopeful news that she's going to bear a child, but she is told that ultimately this child has got a very special calling on his life before he's even born. God has a purpose for us before we're even born, while we're in the womb, which speaks of the fact that this baby that's in the womb is a child. This is a person. Amen? Okay? And she's told specifically what she is to, to do during this, this time. And her reaction. So how does she react to this news? What does she do? She runs and tells her husband, Honey, you're not going to believe this. Let me tell you, this angel of the Lord came to me and told me that we're going to have a son. And then she specifically tells her husband, Manoah, exactly what the, the angel of the Lord told her. But now I want you to notice something. Um, there at, uh, at the end of verse 7, she says, So then, or behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Do you see anything that kind of stands out there? She says something that, yeah, to the day of his death, that's not recorded in the initial appearance of the Lord. You say, was that a contradiction? No, it's not a contradiction at all. It's just that she is sharing something in more depth what the angel had told her. So she has an understanding that this is going to be a lifetime Nazarite vow for Samson. And she comes and shares this news with her uh, with her husband. Now, we follow up in verses 8 through 23 with the father's questions. All right, Manoah is a man of God. He loves the Lord. He's the leader of his home. But right now, Manoah kind of feels left out. He's like, wow, all this is going on, and I don't know really what's going on at all. So he's got some questions here. So as we, as we read these verses, we're going we're gonna to look at some of these uh, questions. So starting in verse 8, then Manoah prayed to the Lord. What a great initial response. First thing he does, he doesn't chastise his wife and says, you're out of your mind. You've lost your mind. You're crazy. No, what does he do? He immediately goes to the Lord. This just speaks of this man's godliness. He loved the Lord, and he prays to the Lord, O oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. So really we have the first question here. It's not presented as a question, but this is really a question that Manoah has in his mind. What is that question according to verse 8? Why does he, what question does he have for the angel of the Lord? What do we do with this child? How do we raise this child? That's a very important question, a very good question. We move on. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again, not to, Man to Manoah, but to the woman as she sat in the field. But no Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? All right, so that's the second question. Are you the guy that, that gave this message to my wife? And he said, I am. Now, that is a powerful two words right there. I am. We're going to talk about 
why that's important here in just a moment. Verse 12, And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, do you see Manoah's faith, faith there? There's no doubting here. He's trusting that this, that this is a messenger from God, and what he says is true. He says, when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life, and what is his mission? Another question. Okay, what's this, what's this child, what's this going to be his mission? What, what, do you, what is God's plan for his life? Verse 13, and the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. So the angel of the Lord's response is basically, he doesn't, he doesn't rehash everything that he told uh, his wife, but basically um, he says, listen, you know, I, I've given your wife detailed instructions. Perhaps he said, be smart, listen to your wife. Listen to your wife. Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine. He, he gives a kind of a, a synopsis here of the directions, the instructions he gave to her. Verse 15, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. So that's really another question. Hospitality in this day was very, very important. So the question is, hey, can you stay for dinner tonight? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat of your food, but if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. So in other words, hey, I, I can't, I'm not going to stay and eat dinner with you, but you can offer a burnt offering to the Lord. Show your devotion to him through offering an, a burnt offering. For, Mo, for Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? Another question. So that when your words come true, we may honor you. Hey, we want to know your name. So when all this comes to pass, we want to honor you as this messenger from, from God. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. My name is too wonderful to even say, to describe it's great, it's glorious. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders, and Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that she was the angel of then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. Now, what do you think this means, that this was the angel of the Lord? Okay, this is not just any angel. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. This is God himself. Going back to what I pointed out just a moment ago, where I said uh, in verse 11, are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, what? I am. Okay, so this at this point now, Manoah really gets nervous here. And, and he says, after he realizes it, it, it comes to his understanding, this is God. Again, Manoah was a godly man. He was in tune with God. He's a discerning man. And he knew when he was in the presence of the Lord, and it clicks with him. Hey, this isn't just an angel. This is God himself. And by the way, you don't have to wait until you get to the New Testament to find Jesus. Jesus is all throughout the, the Old Testament. Verse 22, And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. So here's really a, kind of another question. Manoah's like, aren't we going to die? Because we've just seen God. Now, why do you think Manoah would say that? Because in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, 20, God said, man shall not see me and live. Again, Manoah was a godly man. He, he, he knew the word. He studied the word. And so he's like, we've just seen God. We hadn't just seen an angel. We've seen God. Now we're going to die. We're in trouble. But now listen to what his wife says. His wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands 
or shown us all these things and now announced to us such things as these. So she's, she's like, honey, just calm down. God, yeah, common sense here. If God was going to kill us, he wouldn't have just told us that we're going to have a baby. And he wouldn't have given us all these instructions. So just relax. Men, there's a lesson in here for us. What's the lesson, guys? Listen to your wives, right? <laughs> Listen to your, to, your, uh, to your wives. That's right. I'm going to go home. and I've already shared this with Michelle, so I already told her, you know. So, so he has all these, these uh, questions. Again, these are all legitimate uh, questions, but it kind of ends with this, this climax where he says, we're going to die. He had, he had this reverence, this respect, because, because like in other places in the Bible, when people recognize they're in the presence of the Lord, they're on their faces and they're in fear. Because when sinfulness is in the presence of pure holiness, the only appropriate response is reverence and fear. And that's what we see from this, uh, this uh, couple. Okay, so we see the Father's questions. Now we, we uh, move on here to the first part of verse 24, and we see the baby's arrival. The baby's arrival. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. So just like the Lord had told her, she, she conceives and gives birth to this son, and they name him Samson, which literally means like the sun. All right? Remember, this is a period of darkness in the, in the nation of Israel. But in the midst of the darkness, God sends a light in Samson. He sends a, he sends a deliverer, like a ray of sunshine. In, in, the, uh, in the darkness. And I, and I was reading one Bible commentator and, and, and he pointed out these similarities between Samson and Jesus. If you haven't already, haven't already seen this, both of their births were announced by angels. Both were given miraculous births. Both were set apart to be deliverers. Both were given everything they needed to fulfill uh, God's will. And yet, we also see some key differences. Samson was the son of Manoah. Jesus was the son of God. Samson was born to a barren woman. Jesus was born to a virgin. Samson was set apart to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Jesus was set apart to deliver us from our sins. And of course, there's one key difference. And what do you think that difference is between Samson and Jesus? We'll, we'll discover this. Samson was disobedient to God, whereas Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience to the Father. All right, so that's the baby's arrival. And then finally, we conclude with the, the boy's blessing. The boy's blessing, and it says, And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in, in Mahayane, Dan, between Zorah and Eshtal. All right, so here we see this young boy, he is blessed mightily from the Lord. He was chosen by God. He was given godly parents. This, this couple, they loved the Lord. So he's raised in an environment that is saturated with prayer, saturated with, with God's word. Uh, and what else was he given? A blessing. The Spirit. The Spirit of God uh, is empowering Samson to fulfill the, uh, the special purpose that God had for him. So, I like what one person said, referring to Samson. You, you remember in your yearbook, you had those different categories, best dressed and all that, and then you had that one category, most likely to succeed. Okay, Samson was most likely to succeed. He has everything that he needs in order to, to do great things from the Lord, but what we're going to find is, is that sadly, he really, really had lots of flaws, and he messes up. All right, um, he, you know, Samson, we're going to see, he had some victories, but he had lots of, of failures. He, uh, he's, he's empowered by the Holy Spirit, but sadly, most of his life, he lived according to his flesh. 
Samson was the strongest man to ever live, but yet at the same time he was the weakest. And we're going we're gonna to find that in the days uh, to come. We'll learn more about Samson's life. All right, so two words of application here. First is a specific word of application. Specifically, we find some lesson here for parents and grandparents, okay? And um, I, I just think that this is interesting. This is, a, this, is a great, this is a great story that speaks to us as parents or grandparents or even those of you who don't have children but you want to be spiritual parents to, um, to somebody. Uh, first of all, what, what we see from this is ultimately our children are not our children. Our children belong to the Lord. He just loans them to us. And I've always loved this picture in, in um, the Old Testament with Moses' mother. Remember that beautiful story of where Moses' mother has to put Moses in the basket? And what does he have to do? He has to let go, or she has to let go of the basket, right? Because she understood that Moses ultimately was not hers. Moses was the Lord. And that's a hard thing for us as parents to do sometimes, and even grandparents. We got to let go of the basket and we have to understand that ultimately our children are not ours they belong to the lord he's loaned them to us for a purpose and just like money we talk about being good stewards of our money god has loaned us our children so we want to be good stewards of our children and our grandchildren look to god for direction and help you see this this is precisely what this couple does they go to the lord Lord, show us what to do. How do we raise this special child? And listen, we don't have a chance as parents and grandparents to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord if we're not daily seeking his will and seeking his strength. It is hard. And I know some of you are preaching to the choir because you're, at a, you're already at a, a later season and your children are grown. But you know what? Even when your children are grown, it's still hard, right? It's hard being parents. There's nothing easy about being parents. That's why we have to go to the Lord and seek his wisdom and his, his help. Number three, follow God's instructions. Hey, listen, God had specific instructions for these parents on how to raise this child. And, and while most of us, I would say all of us, none of our children have taken a lifetime, you know, um, Nazarite vow, but he gives us instructions on how to raise our children and our grandchildren. And ultimately, the goal that we should have for our children is for our children to ultimately bring glory to God with their lives. I know you've heard me say this many times, but our children, our grandchildren's greatest need is what? Salvation, to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to live for his glory and his honor. And so we have to do it God's way. Now, in this culture in which we live, there's a great temptation, even as Christians, to get deceived and to be tempted to raise our children the world's way. And, and, and I know I've shared this with you before, but Adrian Rogers once said, don't let good things keep you from the best thing. And there's a lot of good things out there that unbeknownst to us, can pull us out of God's will when it comes to raising our children. And we want to be wise to that. And then finally, well, not finally, I've got one more after this. When it comes to parenting and, grand, and being grandparents, trust God with the results. Trust God with the results. You know, a good upbringing, you can, you can raise your children in church, you can pray with your children, you can teach your children, the Bible, but that is no guarantee that our children are going to grow up and be God-fearers. It's just not. If our children grow up to loving Jesus, it is only going to be because of the grace of God. That's it. We're not responsible for the results. Amen? But we are told how to raise our children so that they will love uh, the Lord. So it's not our responsibility for how our children turn out. Um, because, you know, you, you may know of people, or maybe even in your personal experience, you did everything you could to be godly parents, but your children are not walking with the Lord, or you know somebody that their children aren't walking with the Lord. 
So really the question that we should ask ourselves is, is not so much how can we produce godly children as parents or grandparents. The question we should ask is how can we be more godly parents? How can we model, how can we model the Christian life for our children and for our grandchildren? And by the way, church family, you may not have grandchildren, you may not have children, but you do have spiritual children right here in this church. And they're watching you. Believe it or not, they're watching you and they're listening to you. And so we, we have to ask ourselves, how can I be a better example? And you know what this, this couple does that I, that I think that we get from this text? They have a strong marriage. Do you get that from this text? The first thing the wife does when she's given this, uh, this um, message, she runs to her husband, right? They have, a, they, have a, they have a close relationship. And the best thing that we can do for our children and our grandchildren is to have healthy marriages. Okay? And you see this in, this, uh, in this, this family. And then finally, again, this application is for us as parents and grandparents. Don't beat yourself up over your mistakes. Don't beat yourself up over your mistakes. There are no perfect parents. Praise God for grace. Amen? Samson's parents were not perfect parents. They had the desire to live for the Lord, and they were godly, but they were not perfect. So that's the specific word of application. And then finally, there's more of a general, broad word of application, and that is simply this. And we're going to see this in the life of Samson. He's going to, he's going to illustrate this application in, in the weeks ahead. But, but, but the simple application is this. What matters most, are you listening? What matters most is not how you start, but it's how you finish. Samson, he has a great start, but he doesn't have a great finish. Why did he not have a great finish? Because Samson lived according to his flesh. His flesh ate him alive. And you know what? As Christians, every day when we wake up in the morning, we have a decision to make. Lord, am I going to surrender myself to your control? Am I going to walk according to the Spirit? Am I going to be f uh, filled with the Spirit today? Or am I going to walk according to my flesh? And listen, if we're walking according to our flesh, there are things that we have the capability of doing that we cannot even possibly comprehend. There's things that we can do. And so, the challenge here from the very beginning from Samson's life is it doesn't matter so much how well you start what matters is how well are you going to finish, okay? All right, well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we, we thank you for each and every story that's in your, your word. And, and, and Lord, certainly you did great mighty things through the life of Samson, but Lord, we see where Samson, sadly, for most of his life, walked according to his flesh. He lived to please the flesh, and we see the disastrous consequences that uh, he faced because of that. And we'll learn more about that in the days to come. Lord, I pray for parents and grandparents and ultimately all of us as we, as we set an example for children. Lord, I pray that our ultimate desire would, would be for our children to come to know Jesus, to live for you. And, and after they leave our home, that they will, they will live lives that bring glory to your great name. And Lord, you've told us, you've given us instructions as parents what we're to do. But Lord, we acknowledge that first of all, there are no perfect parents and we thank you for your grace and your forgiveness and your patience. But Lord, we, we acknowledge that ultimately the results are up to you. And if any of our children, any of our grandchildren, if they, if they go on living for you and for your glory, it's only going to be because of your grace. Lord, our children belong to you. May we always keep our hands open, realizing that you've just loaned us our children, and may we be good stewards with them. And, and Lord, as your people tonight, may we have resolved that however long we live on this earth, that we want to finish well for your glory. Father, we thank you and we praise you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you, and we'll see you on Sunday morning. Men, remember, 8.45, Sunday mornings, we meet in the...